The death of an American ambassador as the Arab Spring threatens to turn into an autumn of discontent. We've seen rage and violence over an awful internet video. It looked like this election was all about the economy, but that changed when terrorists murdered four Americans at the United States consulate in Benghazi, Libya on the anniversary of 9-11. Americans had questions. Who did this and how? Should our government have seen it coming? Did President Obama try to hide the truth? Is this a huge scandal that exposes a failed Obama foreign policy? Or is Mitt Romney just saying it is? Tonight, we'll try to give you answers. We'll walk you step by step through the terror that unfolded that day. And we'll break down the political maneuvering that's followed. But we begin with a series of frightening developments and troubling decisions leading up to that horrific night in Benghazi. It's a story you haven't heard, told by a man who tried to prevent what happened on September 11th, 2012. No one understands more than Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood the full extent of the fiasco that killed Stevens. He worked closely with Stevens for six months in Libya before his violent death. A 24-year U.S. Special Forces veteran, Wood's job was to try to prevent such an attack from occurring. Security on the compound consists of five diplomatic security special agents and four members of the Libyan government security force called the 17th February Brigade. April 6, 2012, a bomb is tossed over the wall of the Benghazi compound. June 6, 2012, an IED is placed on the compound's north gate. No one is injured in either incident. That's not the case five days later. June 11, 2012. A convoy transporting Great Britain's ambassador, Sir Dominic Asquith, is ambushed in Benghazi. He isn't hurt, but two of his security aides are. In the past year, there have been more than 230 security incidents in Libya. They were building toward, um, you know, additional attacks. That's why Wood and Eric Nordstrom, the regional security officer, implored the State Department to keep Wood's SST force in Libya beyond its scheduled August departure. We weren't re requesting additional security. We were requesting to keep the security that we had, and that was being taken away. August 5th, 2012. The State Department decides not to keep the SST in Libya, and the MSD team is being reduced as well. So who opposed the request? Charlene Lamb. Because you knew about all these other attacks that had taken place, it had been 12, 14? We had been training local Libyans and arming them. Why do you think this request was denied? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, were you just flat flabbergasted that, you, you, like, what can we do? We couldn't even keep what we had. I think that what was motivating the State Department was that if we had security that would have truly been appropriate, it would have been an admission that conditions on the ground in Libya were not safe. And that would have violated the world view that, uh, that this had been an administration success. You left Libya in August, uh, less than a month before the attack. August 14th. How did you feel about the security situation when you left? I didn't like it. September 11th, 2012. A mob gathers at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt, then scales the walls and burns the American flag. The explanation is that they're angry over an obscure anti-Islam video produced in California. <laughs> Meanwhile, something else is going on in Benghazi. At about 5 p.m. Eastern time, the first reports about an attack come across the wire. It won't be until morning, however, until America learns how serious that is. We weren't there. We just weren't there. And if you were, could you have protected Ambassador Stevens? Well, the more guns you have in a firefight, the better chance you have of winning. Outside the main gate of the compound, on the other side of the U.S. mission walls in this Benghazi neighborhood, all is quiet. No stirrings of any protest, no sign of the real hell about to unfold. In fact, the ambassador decides to turn in for the night. 9 p.m. Still no sign of any kind of spontaneous demonstration over that WEMP video. A protest the Obama administration would later suggest escalated into a deadly riot. 
Joining Stevens in the main residence building is Information Management Officer Sean Smith and four Diplomatic Security Special Agents. Another agent is at the nearby Tactical Operations Center. All these agents are armed with pistols. 9.40 p.m. This amateur video apparently captures the first movement outside the compound. The mad mob of attackers break through here, the main gate, a weak point in the defense of the mission. And then they move on here to the understaffed Libya militia barracks. They storm the place. They torch it. They light up embassy cars around it. And then they move on. According to eyewitnesses, the fighters are well armed and organized, flying the radical Islamist flag, some with foreign accents. The agent in the operations center sees in monitors scores of men pouring into the compound. A diplomatic security agent working in the tactical operations center immediately activated the imminent danger notification system. State Department official Charlene Lamb was working that night in Washington, and so she could follow the events in real time. He also alerted the quick reaction security team stationed nearby, the Libyan 17th February Brigade, the embassy in Tripoli, and the Diplomatic Security Command Center in Washington. Back here in the main residence, the special agent, reportedly David Ubin, comes here and gets Ambassador Stevens from his bedroom and brings him, along with Sean Smith, to this room in the safe haven. The safe haven is only safe for a short time. It's a delay for an aggressor, um, but it has to rely on someone to come in to, uh, to rescue him as well. That someone, Wood says, might have been his elite site security team, but they've been pulled out of the country. Either way, Stevens, Smith, and Ubin were trapped by diabolical killers who pour diesel fuel around the house, light it, and leave. Around 1 a.m., Ambassador Stevens is brought by car here to the Benghazi Medical Center, where doctors try desperately to resuscitate him for some 45 minutes. They fail. He dies of severe asphyxiation. Back at the annex, the battle is on again. Fighters hitting the place with AK-47 fire and rocket propelled grenades. Around 4 a.m., this annex compound is hit by another wave of attacks. It is described as planned and precise. A round of mortar fire targeting the roof of a building set well behind this gate. That turns out to be dangerous and deadly. Killed in that attack, two security personnel, Glenn Doherty, 42, and Tyrone Woods, 41, both former Navy SEALs. Badly injured, Special Agent David Ubin. 8.30 a.m. September 12th. The second plane leaves with the remaining Americans on board and the bodies of Ambassador Stevens, Smith, and Agents Doherty and Woods. It's less than a month since the military site security team left the country to the regret of its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood, who says they would have made a difference. Chris Stevens was the first U.S. ambassador killed on duty in more than three decades. September 11th, 2012 was a tragedy that will long be remembered. Then the story moved back to Washington. Was what followed the fog of war, an attempted cover-up, or something else? September 12th, in the Rose Garden, President Obama seems to embrace an idea he and his top aides will advance more explicitly over the next two weeks that Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other Americans were killed in a spontaneous riot over an anti mohammed internet video and not a planned attack. He does use the term terror, but only in a general sense, in the context of the September 11, 2001 Al-Qaeda attacks. No acts of terror will ever shake the resolve of this great nation, alter that character, or eclipse the light of the values that we stand for. September 13th. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton suggests the attack was just a spontaneous demonstration about the anti-Islam video. There is no justification, none at all, for responding to this video with violence. Current White House Press Secretary Jay Carney says so flat out the next day. These protests were in reaction to a video. We have no uh, information to suggest that it was a pre-planned uh, attack. And later that day, when the President and Secretary of State greet the deceased at Joint Base Andrews, Clinton talks again about the video. We've seen rage and violence directed at American embassies over an awful Internet video that we had nothing to do with. September 15th, California authorities haul Nikula Basili Nikula, 
the man who produced that video in for questioning and marched him in front of TV cameras. Do you have any regrets? September 16th, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, goes on five Sunday talk shows repeating the same story each time. What happened initially was that it was a spontaneous uh, reaction to what had just transpired in Cairo uh, as a consequence of the video. They panicked. They panicked. Former White House Chief of Staff John Sununu is now a senior advisor to Republican Mitt Romney's campaign. This is purely a political reaction in a White House that had prepared itself to establish a narrative of a president getting rid of the threat of terrorism, using the death of bin Laden to focus on that, and waking up one morning and finding out that terrorism on 9-11 of this year was back full-fledged and even killing a U.S. ambassador. That night on The Late Show with David Letterman, the story seems to shift slightly. President Obama says the video did spark Muslim outrage, which terrorists then exploited to attack and kill Ambassador Stevens. You had a video that was released by uh, somebody who lives here, uh, sort of a shadowy character. This caused great offense uh, in much of the Muslim world. Uh, but what also happened was extremists and terrorists uh, used this as an excuse uh, to uh, attack uh, a variety of our embassies, including the one, uh, the consulate in, in Libya. September 19th, Capitol Hill. The head of the National Counterterrorism Center testifies and plainly states what most everyone already knows. And I would say yes, uh, they were killed in the course of a terrorist attack on our embassy. September 24th, ABC's The View. There's no doubt that the kind of weapons that were used, uh, the, the ongoing assault, uh, that it wasn't just a mob action. The next day, September 25th, the president mentions the video six times at the United Nations. There's no video that justifies an attack on an embassy. October 8th, at a San Francisco fundraiser, President Obama pushes the idea the threat from al-Qaeda is waning. And today, al-Qaeda is on its heels, and Osama bin Laden is no more. Then, the next day, October 9th, the State Department provides off-camera a blow-by-blow -blow account of the Benghazi attack. Reporters learned the compound was overwhelmed by an organized assault. Fighters armed with machine guns, mortars, and possibly rocket-propelled grenades. October 10th, Congress holds a contentious hearing on the attack in Libya. And Americans learn that State Department officials, despite being warned of escalating attacks, refused to beef up security in Libya. What do you think al-Qaeda looks like today, especially in North Africa? It's much stronger. It's spreading out. Uh, so there's no question in your mind that al-Qaeda is stronger in North Africa today than it was four years ago. Oh, absolutely. We've got all kinds of new franchise operations. The Benghazi attack and the administration's reaction to it suggest to Goss that this White House doesn't get it. The problem is they're avoiding reality, and bad things happen when you avoid reality, and unfortunately we've just seen that. The attack on our consulate can't be blamed on a reprehensible video insulting Islam despite the administration's attempts to convince us of that for so long. Wasn't this a massive intelligence failure, Vice President Biden? What it was, it was a tragedy, Martha. We will get to the bottom of it, because whatever mistakes are made will not be made again. Congressman Ryan. What we are watching on our TV screens is the unraveling of the Obama foreign policy. And they wanted but, more security there. Well, we weren't told they wanted more security again. We did not know they wanted more security again. Biden not only places the blame squarely on the State Department and the intelligence community, he also seems to flatly contradict what State Department officials have said under oath. Then Thursday, October 18th, a report claims Secretary of State Clinton ordered security in Libya beefed up, a request that was never carried out. And just today, official State Department cables showing Ambassador Stevens was increasingly worried about al-Qaeda security threats in the weeks leading up to the Benghazi attack, and even cables signed by Stevens on September 11th, the day he was killed. More reasons for America to ask, who is ultimately responsible for leaving those Americans so vulnerable? If it's the White House, this will be devastating. But Mark Stein hopes the political post-mortem doesn't obscure the more frightening fact that terrorism may be back with a vengeance, and America is woefully unprepared. But you know, what's wicked about this, Brett, is that 
The real politicization here is uh, the guys who actually only see this in terms of, you know, Ooh, will, it, uh, will it hurt us in Ohio? Uh, might it cause us problems in Florida? This could go bad for Obama. Uh, nuts to that. It's real bad for the United States because this is a humiliation for the United States. It's bad for Chris Stevens. It's bad for Sean Smith. It's bad for Glenn Doherty. It's bad for Tyrone Woods. They're dead. They're gone. That's and we begin with a Fox News alert. Even more evidence emerging now that the Obama administration knew right away that the Benghazi terror attack was not caused by a spontaneous protest over a video. Fox News obtaining internal State Department emails. One shows an Al-Qaeda-linked group claimed responsibility for the attack as it happened. Molly Hindenburg is live for us in Washington. With more on this developing story, Molly. Good morning, Heather and Patty Ann. These emails were sent on September 11th as the attack was unfolding in Libya. They were sent in real time by the State Department to about 300 to 400 national security officials. In the White House Situation Room at the Pentagon, the FBI, the Director of National Intelligence, and the State Department. And they say a terrorist group had claimed responsibility for the attack. Let's go through the earliest emails. Email number one at 4.05 Eastern Time on 9-11. It said, quote, U.S. diplomatic mission in Benghazi under attack, SBU. SBU stands for sensitive but unclassified. It goes on, quote, approximately 20 armed people fired shots. Explosions have been heard as well. Ambassador Stevens, who is currently in Benghazi, and four personnel are in the compound safe haven. The next email, 50 minutes later, reads, Update number one, U.S. diplomatic mission in Benghazi, SBU. The firing at the U.S. diplomatic mission in Benghazi has stopped and the compound has been cleared. A response team on site is attempting to locate personnel. And this third email, 6.07 p.m. Eastern Time on 9-11. It says the group claimed responsibility. It says that the subject line is update number two. Ansar al Sharia claims responsibility for Benghazi attack. The group claimed responsibility on Facebook and Twitter and has called for an attack on Embassy Tripoli. The State Department has designated Ansar al Sharia as an al Qaeda affiliated group trying to set up an Islamic State in eastern Libya. Now, this story just began breaking late last night, so so far today, no comment from the White House or State Department yet as to why Obama administration officials were calling this attack a spontaneous reaction to an Internet video for weeks afterwards. Ambassador Bolton going on the record telling Greta Van Susteren that this shows that not only did the State Department know what happened from the beginning, but he says there was also a cover-up. What these emails now show uh, beyond any doubt is that the State Department was fully possessed of the information in real time. And it leads to the question why uh, the administration even bothered to ask for CIA assessments. All they had to do was ask the State Department. In fact, one is also tempted to ask, why didn't the CIA ask the State Department what was going on? The one thing I've not understood about the way this played out on September the 11th and the day after uh, is why the entire top levels at the administration weren't on red alert over this. I, I can't speak for what happens well, inside the Obama administration, but I tell you, any administration I'd have been in, the president, his top advisors would have been on this immediately round the clock. This goes to the question we've discussed. What could the motivation be? Uh, one alternative, obviously, we've considered is the cover-up motive. But I tell you, these emails say to me that if anybody at the White House thought they could cover this story up by referring to the Mohammed video with this documentary evidence in real time, then it wasn't just a cover-up. It was an incredibly stupid cover-up. So I think uh, this may be further proof of the ideology explanation, that there's this screen over over consciousness that prevents them from seeing reality when it's put right in front of them. 300 to 400 Obama administration officials knew that this Benghazi attack was a terrorist attack, and yet they went out there and they lied to the American people for weeks on end. Now, these 300 to 400 people in the Obama administration who received these emails in real time knowing that this was an attack, they're friends with people in the mainstream media. They party with these people in the mainstream media, and it's not the mainstream media who's busting out the story, the truth on this. They've 
protected Barack Obama and his people in this administration, allowing this lie to be perpetuated to continue for all these weeks that this attack was due to some benign video that no one really has seen, a trailer of a video on YouTube. It's ridiculous.